Bibles. Nahum chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 3 and verse 6 as we lay the foundation for the message this morning. Let me just remind us that we're in the midst of a series of messages on God. We started several weeks ago with a sermon on the reality of God, and then we began to talk about God's attributes. We'll conclude the series next Sunday as we look at the attribute of God's sovereignty. But this morning, I must share with you the message on His wrath, the wrath of God. I would be amiss if I neglected this characteristic of God. It's as much of God's character as His love, His holiness, His his justice, and all the other attributes we've talked about. So let me share with you this morning my understanding of the wrath of God. Have you found Nahum chapter 1, beginning there with verse 1? The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges, the Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Say it's not so. Yes, the rocks are thrown down by him. Consider the wrath of God. This morning, the great Italian orchestra conductor of the last century, Toscanini, was well known for his ferocious anger as he was his knowledge of music. When members of the orchestra played badly, he'd pick up anything in reach and he would throw it in anger. During one of his rehearsals, A flat note caused him to take his valuable watch, sling it across the room, breaking it into several pieces. Shortly after, the devoted orchestra members gave him a luxurious velvet box containing two watches. One was beautiful gold, and the other was cheap. The cheap one had the inscription, For rehearsals only. You know, we all need those kind of watches. Because anger is alive and well in the character of man. Well, I want you to know today that God gets angry too. In fact, there are times when he is provoked beyond anger to wrath. I read that there was a bumper sticker one time that said, Jesus is coming soon, and boy, is he mad. Wrath and anger is part of God's character. There's a line that can be crossed between God's mercy and God's wrath. Anything that exhausts his patience and defies His righteousness reaps His wrath. He cannot withhold it. It is who He is. Now this is hard for us to admit. Many of us don't want to admit that God gets angry and especially He gets angry at us. We'd rather see the God of love, most often depicted in the New Testament, 
rather than see the God of wrath often depicted in the Old Testament. In fact, the preaching of the wrath of God has become taboo in many churches in our day. To speak of the wrath of God makes Christians appear to some as narrow-minded and judgmental. But please remember, God is immutable. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The truth is, God is perfect in love. He is also perfect in wrath. We like the love part. We don't like the wrath part. But for us to fully understand God, we must learn that at times He is provoked beyond anger toward wrath or with wrath toward us. We may not understand it, but we need to affirm its truth. The Bible teaches it. Nahum declares it. Look at the last part of verse 2. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. I read about a cartoon that showed two men who were talking. One said, well, they shot my dog Fido. The other responded, oh my, was he mad? And the first man said, well, he wasn't too happy about it. The Bible teaches that God can be provoked beyond anger to wrath. And we're not real happy about that. Well, let's move to the text. We know very little about the minor prophet Nahum and the little village that he was from, Elkoshite. By the way, this, among others, is called a minor prophet, not because it's insignificant, but because it is short. We do know, however, from verse 1, this about this book and this prophet Nahum. We know that his prophecy was a vision from verse 1. We have talked about that last week when we talked about Habakkuk telling us it's a vision stresses that his prophecy comes from the Lord himself. We also notice that it is a vision that speaks of and speaks to Nineveh. Nahum also uses the same Hebrew word that Habakkuk used. It's the word Masah. It's best translated burden because Nahum is burdened about his message of judgment he must preach. We first heard of Nineveh 150 years earlier through the ministry of Jonah. You remember how God sent the reluctant prophet to Nineveh to warn of impending destruction due to their wickedness. But the people of Nineveh repented and judgment was averted. But now in a short period of time, Nineveh has reverted back to her wickedness and God now has raised up another prophet by the name of Nahum to speak to Nineveh impending judgment. I must give you a brief history lesson here. Following the reign of Solomon, God divided the kingdom of Israel. To the north was called Israel. And the capital city was Samaria. To the south was called Judah. And the capital city was Jerusalem. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And God in judgment 
allowed Assyria to attack and conquer and take the inhabitants of Samaria, the capital city of Israel, into captivity. And once Assyria took that area of Israel, they set their sight on the southern kingdom, the southern capital of Judah. But God intervened and he stopped the siege. You can read all about it in 2 Kings 17 to 19. But it is in the midst of this siege that Nahum stands and he delivers God's message of wrath to be released on the capital city of Assyria, Nineveh. Oh, don't you know the people of Israel were excited to hear that prophecy. I just believe they were jumping with joy. Nahum says to God's people, God reserves wrath for his enemies. Now you may think if God reserves wrath for his enemies as a child of God, I'm home free. But we also learn from this story that God reserves wrath for his own when provoked through rebellion and disobedience. Now, with that introduction in place, I want to tell you what I've learned about wrath, God's wrath. I'm going to define it for you today by way of outline. I've got four things I want to bring to you. Each point begins with the P. First of all, I want you to know it is pure. It is pure. Look, if you will, at verse 2. Nahum says, God is jealous. The word jealous here is related to the word zealous. In fact, they're both derived from the same Latin word. The Hebrew word that Nahum chooses here, transliterated, is gana. G-A-N-A, it means to be jealous. It means to burn with zeal. To be jealous means to feel deeply and passionately about something. To be deeply stirred emotionally and motivated into action. Friend, God is deeply angry at Nineveh. He is stirred to action. He is burning with zeal. He is hot. He's ready to destroy the city. But understand, his wrath is not like human wrath. Most often times when we get angry, we are offensive and our pride gets in the way. Even when we're angry over the right things, our own selfishness and sinfulness pollutes our anger. But God's wrath is different. His anger is pure. It's untainted by sin. Sometimes you will hear it referred to as righteous indignation. He is always right. He is always righteous. He's always perfect even in his anger. Do you know why? Do you know why his anger, his wrath is pure? Two reasons. I've written it there in your outline for today, recorded in the bulletin. It is pure because it's related to his holiness. Just a reminder, God is holy. We talked about it on the Sunday. We looked at his attribute of holiness. He cannot tolerate sin. His anger is always for the right reasons. It is always a response to sin. It is always a response to the violation of his holiness. You want a good example? Go to the New Testament and read the account where Jesus made that whip and he drove those money changers out of the temple. His anger was a response to the violation of his 
holiness. They were making a mockery of his house. They were making a mockery of the house of prayer. They were making a mockery out of a holy place, the place or house of God. His wrath is pure because it's related to his holiness. It's also related to his justice. Folks, God is just and must be just with us. There's a story in the Old Testament about a man by the name of Achan. God told his people not to take anything from Jericho, but Achan disobeyed. He took some of the things from their victory in Jericho and he buried them underground in his tent. And when the people went down the road to to take just a small village called Ai, the people of God were defeated soundly. And when they got to looking for the cause, they found that Achan had disobeyed God. And there was disobedience and rebellion in the camp. Achan had been warned. And when God found out, or when, when the people found out, and God uh, cast his wrath upon them, Achan was put to death. God responded with wrath to his justice or because of his justice he is always just he will always punish sin he will not let sin go his character demands it it is who he is his wrath is related to his justice as I define the wrath of God The first thing I see is it is pure. It's always right. He never flies off the handle in a momentary rage. Have you heard about the fly that flew into the kitchen and landed on a knife handle? And that knife had been used earlier in the day to cut up some bologna. And that fly ate and ate on the fragments of bologna there on that knife, and he gorged himself so much that when he got up to fly, he couldn't sustain altitude, and he fell to his death. You want to know the moral of the the story? Don't fly off the handle when you're full of bologna. (laughs) Friend, God never does that. His ways or His wrath is always, always, always the right response because it's related to His holiness. It's related to His justice. The first thing I want you to know about His wrath, it is pure. Number two, it is proven. The wrath of God has been revealed or proven Throughout history, Paul wrote in Romans 1.18, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Focus on the word wrath in that verse just a moment. The Greek word that is there, orge, means to swell. Orge is not uh, an uncontrollable burst of anger to which you and I are prone. But rather, orge refers to a settled, inner, deep resentment towards sin that seethes, smolders, swells, and swells, and then explodes when God's mercy and God's grace is fully exhausted. Another word that is in that verse that needs attention is the word revealed. In the Greek language, it comes from two words, apo, which means from, and kalupto, which means cover. Literally, it means to take the cover off or from, to take or uh, or remove the cover from. It is exposing to open view that which has not been visible or known or disclosed before. 
Paul writes, the wrath of God has been revealed. The wrath of God has been revealed. The cover's been taken off. It is shown and it is revealed. Something else you should know about that one word revealed. In the Greek language, it's in the, continu- it's a, it's in the present tense, which means continuous action. So it should literally read, it is constantly being revealed. I want you to know that God's wrath is not new. It is something that has been revealed time and time again. It is proven. We first see it in the Garden of Eden. You remember Adam and Eve sinned, and they were cast out of the Garden of Eden. And earth, the earth was cursed, and death, death became a terrible reality. The wrath of God was then shown with the flood. Genesis 6, 7 says, The Lord grieved that He made man on the earth, and His heart was filled with pain. God poured out water upon man, and He covered the earth. He also showed His wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah. I read that Sodom and Gomorrah is the most frequently used Bible illustration of God's wrath. It's used 22 times in the Bible proving the reality of God's wrath. Can you see how God has proven has proven his wrath? The garden of Eden. The flood Sodom and Gomorrah. But friend, listen. The greatest demonstration of God's wrath was the suffering of Christ upon the cross. When He released His full fury against sin. That's what Jesus saw in that cup that He prayed about in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus looked into that cup He saw sin and the full wrath of God being poured out upon him. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. And he cried out, Father, let this cup pass from me. Not as I will, but as you will. There have been times throughout history that catastrophes have happened. And the people of God had pointed to the catastrophes and said to the world, it's the wrath of God. And many non-believers, well, even believers, disagree because they do not understand the wrath of God. But one thing that I want you to see is this. The wrath of God is being shown Continually, Paul wrote, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Friend, as long as there's ungodliness and unrighteousness upon this earth, the wrath of God will be revealed. And you can say, no, that's not the wrath of God if you want to. But it is revealed continually. So according to God's word, it is proven. It has been revealed and released at different times in history. Do you ever wonder if the people of this world today, whom it appears are enjoying their sin, do you ever think about, are they going to get away with that? No. Look at verse 3b. And the Lord will not at all acquit the wicked. Paul explains in Romans 2.5, In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself the wrath of God. Consequences 
can be stockpiled until they come crashing down. Yeah, it can be treasured up. I read about a farming community in which most of the farmers in the community were Christians. And they would gather on Sunday in the Lord's house. There was one exception. There was one man, one farmer in the community that claimed to be an atheist. He would chide his other farmer neighbors saying, hands that work are better than hands that pray. Part of this man's property bordered the church property. And so when Sunday would come, he would always make it a habit to get out on his tractor and ride on his property next to the church making noises. One year, his land produced more than anyone else's in the community. And so he submitted a lengthy letter to the editor of the newspaper boasting what a man could do without God. The editor of the newspaper printed that letter, but then he concluded with his own words. God doesn't settle all accounts in October. Friend, the wrath of God is proven. It is continually revealed. Sooner or later, the wrath of God is released and the accounts are settled. It is proven. Number three, it is patient. You know I see that in verse 3a. The Lord is slow to anger. You know what that means? It's hard to get God mad. It means he's willing to give people the opportunity to repent. He wants to give us time to see the righteousness of his own character. He also wants to give us time to see the inevitability of his judgment. So he gives us time. And he gives us opportunity to repent. He's slow to anger. 2 Peter 3.9 God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. So he gives everyone the opportunity to repent. Years ago, there was a famous outspoken atheist by the name of Robert Ingersoll. He was lecturing one day, and he took out his watch, and he declared, I'll give God five minutes to strike me dead if all these things that I have said are not true. The minutes ticked by, you see, and nothing happened. But when the incident came to the ears of one of the great preachers of the day, Joseph Parker, he said, and did this gentleman think he could exhaust the patience of eternal God in five minutes. Folks, God is patient. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Friend, he's not some madman with his finger on the wrath button hoping that we mess up. Oh, no, friend. He is patient hoping we will repent. Number four. I'm describing for you the wrath of God. It is pure. It is proven. It is patient. But here's the final one. It is purposeful. Look at verse 2. The Lord avenges. Verse 2. Part B. The Lord avenges. The Lord will take Vengeance on his adversaries. That's the purpose. Vengeance. But let me tell you something about his vengeance. His vengeance is not retaliation. Now you see, we tend to want to retaliate toward our enemies. It's who we are. It's part of our flesh nature. I read about a traveling executive that was angered at a baggage handler in the airport because he didn't think he was moving fast enough. And he spoke very angrily toward that man. 
And after the executive had left, one of the witnesses of the event empathized with the baggage handler, saying, I'm sorry for what he said. The baggage handler said, don't worry about it. I'm going to get even. The man said, well, how are you going to get even? And he said, well, the man's going to Chicago, but his baggage is going to Japan. (laughs) Hey, isn't that our way? Isn't that our way? Retaliation. But you see, God does not release his wrath to get even with us, even though we have hurt him badly. Listen, folks. God could whip us day in and day out all day long and not pay us back for what we've done to him. No, his vengeance is not retaliation. His vengeance is retribution. Retribution. It is punishment with purpose, and that purpose is reformation. God wants it. Wrath, anger, t- over sin to lead to our repentance. A girl with leg braces became discouraged with her condition and frustrated over her time in physical therapy. And one day her father insisted that she go to physical therapy. She fell into his arms crying, but daddy, don't you love me the way I am? And the father said, yes, honey, I love you the way you are, but I love you too much to let you stay that way. And that's the way God is. Friend, he loves us so much. He loves us too much to let us continue on our sin, and he releases his wrath to change us, to bring us to the point of repentance. His wrath has purpose. Now friend, listen, we may not want to admit it, we may not understand it, we may not like it, but our God is a God of wrath. The Bible teaches it. I've defined it for you the best I know how. It is pure. It is proven. It is patient. And finally, it is purposeful. Now, let me conclude. What does that mean for us today? Well, I think it could mean or should mean comfort. Nahum means comforted or consolation, by the way. His message concerning the destruction of Nineveh was intended to comfort the people of God. They could take comfort in knowing that God takes vengeance upon His enemies. Oh, friend, today, we live in a day when it seems like the wicked prosper, evil triumphs, the good suffer, and crime pays. But you can take comfort, my friend, as a child of God. The Lord will take vengeance upon his enemies. The ungodly will one day reap his wrath. We should find comfort in that. But there's something else. We should find comfort, but also we should feel a sense of certainty. Folks, God is a God of justice. He must punish sin. You can be certain there's a payday someday. Please, 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 I'm begging you, do not doubt this truth for one moment. God says vengeance is mine. I will repay He will take care of his enemies. You can be certain of that. When we speak of the attribute of God's wrath, it should bring comfort. It should bring certainty to us. But here's my closing question. Let's bring it to the here and now. 
Where do we stand with God? You know, most of us are saved here today. And we think that God's wrath is only reserved for the lost, the unbeliever. But we need to know that the Bible teaches the children of God can provoke Him to anger. And He will respond with chastisement and discipline. Someone once said that when God disciplines, He speaks through your conscience. But if you won't listen, He uses people. And then if you still won't listen, He uses the circumstances of life. And usually, they're the hard ones. Jesus said, Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Maybe we should ask ourselves today, is there anything in my life right now that would make God angry at me? Is there anything that would cause God to chasten me, to discipline me, to correct me? Friend, listen. It's easier when we do the soul searching and it's easier when we do the discipline than when God does it. As my father used to tell me, son, you better straighten up and fly right. That's what God would say to us. It's better if we search. It's better if we discipline. It's better that we change than him have to do it. So maybe a good closing question. Where do I stand with God? Years ago, in an old missionary school in Paraguay, Fred Train was teaching a Bible school in England. And at that school was a particular obnoxious student who was so arrogant, he, it just oozed from his pores. The people avoided him. I mean, they just couldn't cope with him. And this student didn't care much for the ministry of missions. He didn't like being challenged about going out and reaching the unreached. And one day he approached Fred Twain or Train and said, I've just been on the phone with my father in regard to what you've been teaching. My father says that he wants you to know that he thinks it would be a dreadful waste of my life for me to go to the mission field. And he also wants you to know what he thinks about your message. Fred Train responded, I'm very interested to know what your father thinks about you and me and my message and even the Lord Jesus. But I am more interested in what the Lord thinks of your father. That ought to be the most interesting thing to us. Mm -hmm.